Hello, this is Julia Whittup with Talk Story TV, and we have with us today Ermina Tutu, and she will be talking to us about decolonizing my, I don't know how to pronounce that word, but That's, Haitian. That's actually the way Hades, uh, Haitian or Hades spelled is A-Y-I-T-I-A, not H-A-I-T-I-A-N. Oh, okay. Yeah. I didn't know that. Okay. I just had fun. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so welcome, Mermina. Well, Julie, Julia, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Um, this is indeed a pleasure to talk briefly um, about <laughs> what's a, actually a two hour presentation. So I'm going to wow. just mention some aspects of it. But when you, um, you asked me to come on, on board and share with your audience, and of course anybody else that ends up seeing this, I was immediately taken by your website um, and saw what you are about and what you're trying to do, which is so necessary uh, and needed. And so I want to uh, give honor to you and commend you for the work, because I know that's not an easy work um, to, that you've chosen. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I was called. Yeah, you know, rarely is this type of stuff done um, willfully, completely. There's always a little bit of a push and a pull that happens. Mm -hmm. And uh, that would be similar to my experience as well. Um, I was, and I'll just do a little bit about my background, from Haiti, was born and spent the first 10 years of my life. We were talking a little bit about um, the Christianity component. So I went to Christian school. I wanted to be a nun. <laughs> <laughs> I knew from the very beginning that I had this um, penchant or this desire to, 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 to be in complete communion with God. I, I, I always knew that. And I also knew that um, that's all I thought about. Um, even when I talked to people, I always saw things from a spiritual perspective rather than just the mundane. So to me, it just seemed like a logical thing. And then when I came to the U.S. Um, and immediately was was faced with the demonization of voodoo and really demonization of, of being Haitian. Um, this was back in the late seventies when being from Haiti was not very popular. <laughs> oh, no, I imagine it wasn't. <laughs> in the eighties and you know, for those of you who may go back that far, um, you may know, be aware of some of the history and some of the um, scapegoating that happened And Haiti was often used as, as a scapegoat for um, disease and all sorts of things. Yeah. And so I, that, was, that was my coming of age story uh, as a youth. Um, so I quickly uh, kind of took a, a, a turn toward uh, embracing what was not of my culture and try to do away with um, what I, my roots, try to do with my roots as best as I could. And thankfully, my ancestors would not allow me to do that for too long. <laughs> so at some point, I had to do a reclaiming and slowly begin that uh, coming back to it. And I should also add that uh, because my family have houses, spirit houses, spiritual houses, or um, temples, um, it, it was very hard for me to, to run, uh, <laughs> you know, behind our house. So it was kind of hard for me to completely go away from it. And then the other aspect for me was I began to study everything, um, Buddhism, Hinduism. I was just trying to find... You know, if, the, if according to Western uh, belief system, my roots were of the devil, then I had to find God someplace else. So that was the mentality, that was the search I was going <laughs> with. You're not home, so you must be someplace else. And through that search, I discovered, wait a minute, this sounds just like what we do. This sounds, this looks almost like what we do. And, and, and I started to realize this. I was being lied to and you know that process takes a while of to unearth undo the the programming because uh, i went to catholic school undo all of that um and recognize the power that is intricate that is within our own system and when i say power i'm also talking about love as a form of power nurturing uh, community as a form of power i'm not just talking about abilities which most people think but just the, just the, the whole wholesome of being a human being um who's also um spirit embodying flesh so through this process i ended up being what most haitians would call a dias 
which is what? that's somebody who is uh it's a jazz really that's why we say how we say it so i'm not considered to be a hundred percent haitian because most of my adult life is in this country and and in this country i'm not considered to be a hundred percent uh american because i'm born someplace else so i'm considered uh a haitian in a diaspora which makes me a jazz which is short for diaspora and that that initially was a upsetting term and then i realized it gave me some it gave me an objective as well as a projective or a whatever perspective on a lot of different things so i've embraced that <laughs> that title <laughs> you've embraced standing in the middle diaspora. um and it, and it gives me a unique perspective um as far as what i do so fast forward all the way till today and what i have been called to do is to introduce new generations to the true understanding of voodoo the real um familiar system that it is rather than the hollywood um movie programming and the continuous programming that's still going on right. and and to also support people of african descent or bloodline related to voodoo who want to reconnect with their own roots and to support them with that. Because I know I had to go through reducing or eliminating shame, eliminating fear, uh, a host of other stuff that gets put on in order to finally root myself in who and what I really am. So I'm here to help others do the same thing. Isn't it um, too bad we have to get so, so far through our life before we can throw off that all that? You know, I used to think that, um, that it's now I actually see it as a blessing. Really? Um, I think for me, this, this is the perfect time. Um, all of the unearthing I had to do and, and rebuilding of myself is, was my journey. I, I don't think it was an error of my, I don't think it was outside of my journey. I think my journey is exactly what I've done. It is having been in a Catholic school and having the nuns call me burnt potato. That was an insult that was used, which was obviously a racist remark. Um, you know, and then having that be built in my psyche as what the heck is a potato? <laughs> Are you my potato? And, and, you know, I was very young. So, and then having to overcome the concept of devil as being my ancestors. Really, if you bring it down to the basics, um, that's really what that is when you say that um, you're worshiping the devil, and of course you're talking about somebody's ancestors. You're basically telling them you're worshiping, or you're elevating, or your um, aspect of who you are is the devil. And you had to learn what the devil was, uh, because that's a whole, also a foreign concept to many indigenous belief systems. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> understand like what do you mean by that oh it's that aspect of yourself that is negative to the positive aspect for yourself but why are you externalizing it to me <laughs> that's all i want to know if we all have our own you know negatives why not just um embrace yours for yours and do the work you got to do and let me embrace mine for mine and do the work i got to do to elevate myself rather than projecting all of it toward a particular group of people but i also realize that you know this happens to so many of us because it's just fear Fear of different groups, fear of um, people doing to us what we did to them, because that's also the fear of people getting retaliation for what was done for the millions and millions of people that were killed um, for the purpose of uh, building an empire. Mm -hmm. You know, so dealing with that guilt rather than projecting that guilt as the devil within some the, per, the very group of people that you've decimated. So all of that had to happen. And, and for me, it makes me, <laughs> you know, I can laugh about something horrible because I realize I'm still not touched. That's good. I feel guilty about what all the white people did, I think. <laughs> you know, and, and that's probably similar to the shame I had to work through. Everybody has something they got to work through and yeah. move through. Everybody. So with your guilt, my, I mean, really, if you think about it, they're kind of opposite, usually not opposite, but different sides of the, the pillars, right? Guilt and shame. Mm -hmm. um, it, everybody's harmed when there is this um, 
in effect, this desire to control other people. Really, this, that's the summary of it. Um, and of course, the it person, happens to women in most cultures. Well, that's the strategy. Um, most people don't realize the easiest target is the women. Um, and that's uh, one of the things I do talk about, uh, and I'll, I'll just share it, is the strategy for conquering any people is missionary, merchant, military. And that threesome has worked for centuries. Um, you start out with the missionary, which is to um, deroute the psyche, the psychology, the gods of, the understanding of root, rootedness. That's the uprooting component. So that's the... Um, ministerial component and it looks so good and you know no. kind that um initially even the people that are being attacked because it isn't a, a spiritual attack they don't not all of them some of them do but a lot of them kind of see well they're bringing gifts they're you know they're teaching they're bringing schools they're bringing food i mean all of this stuff is happening but what ends up happening is a, is an upsurge of power we remove your god and we replace it with ours now your psyche is disembodied from who you really are. Then we bring in the merchants and we tell you, you have to wear this, your, your body is no longer pure in its natural state. You have to look differently. That sounds a little bit like Adam and Eve and the, <laughs> you know, the serpent coming in. <laughs> yeah, in Hawaii where it's so hot, you have to wear those long sleeved long. I couldn't believe they really did that. A lot of it doesn't make sense, but it actually makes sense when you think in terms of um, absorbing power. You know, by when you undress or redress someone in your own image or in the image you want them to, again, you're now uprooting them from um, their foundation because that's part of their culture. The clothes people wear is part of culture. And then lastly, the military only comes in when it's time to protect the merchants and protect the, the uh, those who are there to minister. And because by that time, once the psyche and the clothing has been changed, people actually become self-policing. Yeah. They, they actually police themselves. They, they, because their mind is now captured, so to speak. Um, now, mind you, there are those rogues, you know, the ones who are like, you know, they'll fight through the end, and there's probably quite a few of those, and that's where the military comes in. There's all the ones that you really can't control, and then, of course, to protect the interests of the merchants and the interests of the... Uh, of the um, ministry um so it's a simple strategy it's in the art of war <laughs> it's, it's like it, i'm amazed yeah. you can laugh <laughs> uh well i've i've cried many 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 times um uh, and, and still do sometimes especially when i see things happening in the amazon forest things happening in west africa um in parts of uh, anywhere around the world even things that have nothing to do with people that are indigenous it's still the same strategy like Iraq, like, I mean, the only reason the military went afterwards, the other stuff didn't work. So, yeah. you know, I mean, it's, 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 a, it's a military strategy that's used for conquering people. And then what happens with those of us who are um, spiritual folks, we are here to, to do the, the opposing work. We're not, we're the spiritual, what do you call the peaceful warriors? So we're not necessarily the ones who are going to take uh, our arms, although some of us might, but Generally speaking, it's through words, through ed re-education, through compassion, because understanding that um, there's a lot of pain in those um, descendants uh, of all. There's yeah. so much pain that people carry in their bodies, their mind, their uh, et cetera. So um, our role is to have the compassion to do the work on ourselves first. I want to make sure I say that. Because there's so many healers nowadays who kind of skip that part. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to heal everybody else, but I'm too hard. <laughs> you know, they kind of skip over that a little bit. Let me help you out while I get my stuff together. Um, so, you know, first do our own healing, our own uprooting, our own re re uh, reworking. Uh, I call it self-recreation. Um, do that aspect. We ground ourselves in our own ancestry, our own lineage, whatever it is that makes us feel uh, not feel so much, but whatever it is that connects us deeply to who we really are. And then um, then be able to support others in that journey um, as best as you can. But you gotta Could have you tell us a little bit about the foundations of voodoo and how how it 
is how it does work rather than what we've heard? Okay, that's a big topic. So let me let me say it this way. Um, let me start by saying the first thing is the terminology. So that's the very basic error that I often come across. Um, people saying voodoo, v o o d o o. That's the common accepted um, wording, but that only speaks to an ask one. And that's really the one that's in uh, Louisiana and some other parts of eastern United, uh, southern United States. It does not speak to Haitian vodou, which is spelled V-O-D-O-U. Or there's another spelling, which is a French spelling, but for our interest, it's V-O-D-O-U, which comes from um, the term vodou, V-O-D-O-U-N, which actually uh, can be li likened to spirit. That's the short okay. answer, okay? And okay. from out of um, Benin area um, in West Africa. So the word itself means spirit. So in Haitians, we don't usually use the word voodoo to explain the practice. Um, the practice is literally called um, African service or sevi guine versus what they were taught, which is um, European service, church service. Okay. So there was, the differentiation was African service versus European service. The same way in Haiti, um, the term God is referred to as good God versus the God that was enslaving us, the bad God. So in Haiti, <laughs> which means good God versus the God that, that said, you, you know, because I, I think the Bible was used often to uh, tell people, to keep people enslaved as well as indoctrinate them. So we had to differentiate between a God that didn't think that this was acceptable versus the other God. And then the other aspect too, there's hoodoo, which is um, the practice of a lot of the, um, what you would call uh, the mystic aspect of it, uh, the conjuring aspect of it, without any of the familial and other support systems. So that's just hoodoo, which is conjure work. Anybody can do conjure work in hoodoo, regardless of religion, regardless of background. It's all over the United States, really. Um, so the very first thing I would recommend um, is someone to clarify the terminology to begin with. So when you're speaking about Haitian voodoo, recognize it is an offshoot, just like you have um, Christianity and then you have offshoots of Christianity, um, like Protestantism and, I don't know, all the different types, Mormon. It's, this is, think of it in the same way. You have voodoo in Africa, and then you have voodoo in Haiti. It's an offshoot of, it's an adaptation of a system based on what we had available on the island and also the conglomeration of those that, that we came in contact with, the uh, Arawaks and um, the island, as well as the, um, the Christian, Christianity aspect of it. So once that is understood, then it takes away from a little bit from, I hope, a little bit from some of the Hollywood stuff. <laughs> um, recognize that it's a much more diverse and broad um, practice. The other thing, too, it's a lifestyle. It's not, um, just like Hinduism is a lifestyle, you know, um, just like a lot of other uh, traditions or lifestyles, they're not something you do on Sunday and then you live a different life. It's actually a way of living. It encompasses um, voodoo when it's being done in a certain area, encompasses policing aspect, um, taking care of the elderly. <laughs> I mean, it's much broader than just rituals. It's okay. actually an entire system for a, a particular group of people, wherever they may be. And there's different, um, it's practice. It has slight differentiation depending on which part of the country you go to. Um, the way I grew up is, 100% familial, meaning I, I learned what my mother learned, my mother learned what my grandmother learned, and so on and so forth. And some of our songs are a little bit different than, let's say, a song from another family a few hundred you know, miles away. It might be the same kind of song, but we adapted to fit our own bloodline. Oh, okay. So when, you, when I see people, like, for example, talk about certain songs and they try to put things into these very narrow, that's okay for somebody coming in who needs to have definitions, who needs to have a matrix to work in. But what I hope people get is 
understand that those of us who grew up and live and practice on a regular basis, we are living a familiar system. Right. Okay. Bloodline. Um, so it's, it's, it's a little bit different than um, something you adapt and then you have a matrix to adapt into. Okay. Does that answer the question? Yeah. Um, we had talked about you doing some chanting. Are you still <laughs> going to do that? <clears throat> me, 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 me. No. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I will. Um, so give me a second. I'll think of something. Um, okay. Kote uye dan mapshashe u dan Kote uye dan mapshashe u dan Mama mwe dan wo papa mwe dan Mama mwe it's another one. <clears throat> Zando papa le bazando. Zando papa oke zando. Zando, zando. Zando papa le ba zando li vele. Ale ba piyan piyan o zando. O zando, toi ou toi fe zando. O zando, toi ou toi fe zando. Zando papa le ba zando. Zando, papa, ok, zando. Zando, zando. Zando, zando. Zando, papa, les ba, zando, li, li. Ali, ba, pi, yon, pi, yon, zando. Um, the two, the first two songs I chose, the first one is a song that was given to me, and that's something that I specify um when a song is given it means the spirits come and, and give you a song and it's a healing song that was given just to me for uh during a time i was going through some deep suffering it was given to me to support um the de the development of my mind for lack of a better word but really it relates to the energy of dumb which is dumb by which is um hmm, which is zeus <laughs> I mean, that's the only other uh, way I can describe it. But yeah, it would be the, 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 the energy of, of that, um, um, which is um, all omnipresent, the energy of omnipresence. Okay. So that song supported me for a while, and I still sing it. And then the second one is a song that is a family song for the energy of the crossroads, which opens doorway in... Uh, remove certain uh, barriers, open doorways, really is a summary of it. Um, also known as a trickster energy, um, but the trickster has to do with the ego mind. So the real trickster is us. <laughs> and what we're for. <laughs> um, but uh, so that song deals with a particular type of crossroad energy because it's a family of energies. It's a family of cosmic forces. So within Lake Ba, there's tons and this particular one works with, um, with my family. Uh, and I also share it because I learned the song initially from uh, some, I'm gonna call it a record, a record or something. And then I went to my mom and I said, do you know this song? She's like, yeah, that's our song. <laughs> and I was like, what? And then she's like, but that part doesn't, we don't say that part, so I had to, you know, I had to learn our way, so to speak, and for that particular song, because what I learned was somebody else's way. Um, so she corrected me. <laughs> like, that's our song. Okay. Tell me, how cool. 
<laughs> you're so lucky to have a mom who remembered all that. She she remembers quite a bit. Um, not everything, because as you know, um, part of it is is um, she went through the same experience we, everybody goes through, removing of information. Um, I think one of the things I was sharing with you earlier uh, before we started was how there's a constant influx of missionaries um, who are still going down and, and literally uprooting people from their um, spiritual support. And I have, and I don't want to say too much because I don't want to call anybody out, but I have family members and one in particular who's an elder, old elder, uh, above 90, I'll say that, mm -hmm. who now has converted and from what kept her alive and well for 90 plus years, I can only laugh about that part, um, because of the fear of, of in the constant influx. Of but, that fear thing about hell. Yeah. And, but, but what I know and, and what gives me a lot of, uh, what gives me, um, hmm, what makes me continue and feel okay about all of this is I know nothing, nothing dies. So the energy that, I, that is within me or within her that's being suppressed is never going to go away. It'll just get passed on to somebody else, another generation. So it's impossible to um, suppress any group of people for long. And the amount of energy it takes to continuously suppress them actually deters from the group doing the suppressing. So, yeah, in the meantime, people do suffer. And, and I do have a much uh, high view of this, which means that I'm not in it in, in the suffering I'm looking at down on it and I'm going, yeah, but the information doesn't go away. Uh, I had songs come to me in dreams. I can't. Oh, really? yeah. um, I have songs come to me um, just by seeing a word, um, you know, pop up in front of my face. Because your mind, everything that is suppressed remains whole in the ocean of your subconscious mind. It doesn't get destroyed. Now, what does happen is you have folks who lose the memory of it but it eventually comes back up. Right. Eventually. That's good. <laughs> That's good. I think we are recovering a lot of things now. Now is a good time. Yes, absolutely. Um, and that brings me to the whole decolonization of my Haitian voodoo, a personal journey of rediscovering, reconnecting, remembering, and returning to the core of my traditions. Well, this is a couple of Um. And one of the things that I did want to make sure I covered today, uh, just in case we run out of time, is a traditional greeting in Haiti. Um, most people know this, um, who are connected to Haiti in some way, uh -huh. is kind of similar to Namaste, um, but it's One, which is honor, and uh -huh. which is respect. So the, the one person will say One, and the other person will respond respect. Oh, and cool. um, and that's very and if you one of the things that I think you know Julia is a lot of indigenous cultures greet each other in this sort of way versus hello or hi or very informal it's a very it's an acknowledgement of the entire entity of the being rather than the physical aspect of it yeah. um, so that's an important connection there and then of course in voodoo it's done all the time um, let's see in terms of the the history we definitely don't have enough time to go into any of that. So what I will say is the misconception about um, what Haiti is known for, like, for example, the extreme poverty, the voodoo, the voodoo dolls, um, aggressive magic. It would be no different than seeing a cult United States by its lowest denomination. Mm -hmm. Okay. It would not be pretty. If somebody described the United States by its lowest common denominator um, and what is the worst thing it's done or it's doing as a, as a people, um, it would not be good. So even with just all over the world, any other culture, country or whatever, including other religions when they're, or systems, when they're known by their lowest common denominator, you can't, it's hard for you to appreciate the full spectrum of what things are. And what I'm finding out with human beings in general um, is we, we feel more comfortable with ends of spectrums. We have a tough time with the full spectrum of stuff. 
and recognizing that within everything is a actual is a spectrum of the worst and then the best mm-hmm. and any culture any system um and how do you how do you find the balance for yourself and that's another thing that i support people on is really identifying and finding your balance and that's the other thing that voodoo does it, it as a system it's all about character development for those who are in it in the right way who are not polarizing themselves it's about achieving balance in life in a balance with nature and balance with family balance with community and balancing all the 401 entities that we recognize within the human body called spirits of cosmic forces. Balance. 200 to the right, 200 to the left, and you're in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, let's see. Oh, one of the things I share with this video is, uh, with this presentation, is some Haitian voodoo songs are actually being used in a lot of um, choirs. And many people don't know that. So there's about three or four of them. So I'm going to sing this one for you. Okay. Um, and then I encourage your uh, listeners or, or anybody that watches this to look up P-Y-E-A-L-E-M-E-N and listen to anglicized version. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> this is the creolized version, which is our original version. And it, it speaks to... Um, um, batala or batala again this, the entity of uh, of um, serpent so to speak the energy of um, what some might call kundalini others might call uh, the DNA aspect of the human being okay okay so um, <clears throat> it goes like this I don't know why but I have to take my glasses off when I think. <laughs> Beali Malini so Batala. Just move faster than that. Beali Malini so Batala. Batala, c'est le wadi failure. Ogu, c'est le wadi failure. Beali Malini so. I think I'll stop. Um, and I made an I error. That's all you need to be standing up, huh? Yeah, well, I'm a dancer too, so. Uh-huh. Sitting put is very. <laughs> <laughs> I can tell because I thought she'd be much com- more comfortable if she could move. <laughs> oh yeah, I move. Over. My presentations are very dynamic. I'm dancing. I'm sing- I'm chanting. I'm pouring libations. Oh, um, I can't wait till you come to Colorado. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, and and I started out as a sacred dancer, as a dancing shaman, as one of my um, good friends termed it years and years ago and that was my first expression um the, and first love in terms of uh, what i like to do and slowly move i didn't start chanting until four years ago oh and, okay. and part of the reason is because i have two other siblings that are fabulous singers and i i put myself into this dancer role all of my life i just i was like i'm a dancer I dance, that's what I mean. It's the dancing, it's the dancing. And then I had a mentor, a spiritual mentor during um, Ifa, which is the Yoruba um, religion uh, consecration, who said to me, you got to start chanting. Why are you not chanting? And I said, I, I just never, I never really thought about it. <laughs> <laughs> Besides, my sister does that. <laughs> I figured we have it covered within the fat. We got two and, you know, I have the dancing part. I figured we got it covered. Uh, and it was very clear at that point I needed to not only chant, but to be a, a wisdom keeper and, and begin to collect and store the songs, which I, I am doing now. And I'm also um, teaching um, small groups um, because it's very, it's not a traditional teaching. It's more of, I'm sorry, it's not like a, the way you would do in a classroom. Like it's a little people, mentorship. 
Right, it's keepers of the song. So it's really sort of, it's a process. Um, like the very first time we meet together, we're not just gonna sing. We have to actually uh, call on the songs, call on the spirit and, and, and this, from there decide which song they're supposed to learn, if they're supposed to learn any of the ones. I, I don't, you know, so it's not something I give, it's really something that is uh, given to them. Okay. But, but I facilitate the process. By because spirit. I have, I have the book and I have, I have, uh, I have books and um, that I've written down and some things like that I can share. Um, but it's, it's a much deeper process because that way it's a sacred, um, it's a sacred, it's a sacred thing. I'm passing on lineage, my bloodline. Yes. Wow. I earn that. <laughs> <laughs> no, you can't just walk in. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so again, there's so much more I could cover. I don't want to go too deep. Maybe, um, let me see what else might be relevant to your groups. Okay, like simple things like voodoo being at least 10,000 years old. Um, voodoo is primarily, D-O-O-D-O-O -O -D -O -O is primarily in Louisiana. I think I mentioned that. Mm -hmm. um, and the whole thing that is in, uh, that is in Hollywood really all came about turn of the century, last century. Um, whereas um, during the, one of many um, um, U.S. Uh, invasions of Haiti, where basically the military came in, saw what we were practicing, took some of that information back, and next thing you know, it's being uh, demonized. That's one of the aspects of it. But that wasn't always the case. Um, that's really a couple centuries old, old not uh, longer than that. Um, the one thing I do want to share, there is this sort of theory about the icons, the, the Christian icons in Voodoo. I don't know if you're familiar with that. No. Um, okay. So... In, in some places, there are Christian icons that are used, and then this, the, the thought behind that, or some people think the, the reason behind that, excuse me, is to be able to practice. The enslaved had to practice behind closed doors, so to speak, so they had these saints as in, in front of them. Well, there's actually two belief systems. There's one that says it's a camouflage that was used, that practice could happen, but there's another group that says it actually was a blending because we recognize that the similarities were present but also it was a way of um, transmuting energy, which is a much deeper way of, um, of uh, co-opting energy. Mm -hmm. so, so, so there's, there's different views about why it happened. Yeah. Some of the saints have archetypal characteristics. Yeah. Um, and I don't practice with, um, I don't use saints. Um, Part of the reason is because I, uh, w at the at the type of work I'm doing now, I actually I am the temple. <laughs> I've become my own temple, my own altar. I am the altar. So, but that wasn't always the case. Um, that took a few decades, really. Um, the other thing is there are major categories in Voodoo. You've got the bitter, hot. You've got the sweet and the cool energies. One is known as Petwo, one is known as Rada. Um, in my family, we have both. My personal work is with the sweet, cool energies called the Rada energies. And you can tell by my voice. So because it is part of your embodiment, you can tell which energies people work with based on their own projection, their own human body projections. I couldn't sound bitter and hot if I wanted to when I sing. I try to sound rock and rollish, but it doesn't come out. <laughs> <laughs> It won't come out. Um, okay. It comes out sweet and cool. That's my voice. That's okay. and, and that means that is the that is my bones. That is my organs. You know that makes the music. That is that comes out of me. Sweet and cool energies, um, primarily. Um, obviously, we have all of them, so we don't necessarily uh, you don't forego one side for the other. You recognize all of them, but the expression that I'm here to share has to do mostly with the sweet and pleasure. It's much deeper than that. And I, I, know, I know you said we only have like 10, 10 minutes and so on. So I didn't want to go too much. I don't know how to get out of this thing. Well, um, I, I think you just 
click on that share screen again and it'll stop it. Yeah, I think I'll stop now and see, because I'm pretty sure I've been talking for at least 10, 10 minutes, if not more. Yeah, you can save your long presentation for when you come. <laughs> okay. I may be stuck here for a moment. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I know that feeling. Uh, sometimes it's better not to touch too many things. <laughs> I know. I've really messed things up before, touching too many things. <laughs> What does this um, button do? <laughs> how do I get out of here? Because um, it's telling me, do I want to share the screen? I'm like, I thought I was already sharing the screen. Um, oh. Yeah. Hmm. So, so uh, I'm going to let it be and just leave it where it is. And if you, we can continue talking, if that's okay with you. Yes. Yes. Okay. So this is interesting, though. But read this. Well, I managed to I managed to remove my screen, but that's okay. Can, as long as other people can see me, I'm okay with that. Okay. So you can still see me, right? Yes, we can still see you. But I've, I've done oh, some. Do we want to stop screen sharing? Because there's a. It's asking me if I want to stop screen sharing. Yeah, if you, if maybe okay. that's part of it. And I apologize to your audience and my audience. Um, oh, there it is. Stop share. There we are. Oh, good. There we are. <laughs> it, would be, it would be under stop share. Got it. <laughs> <laughs> that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, it can only be so complicated. Uh, well, we were in another world there for a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Um, Hmm. Yeah, I'm drawing a blank. So okay, talk to us about the voodoo dolls because everybody's heard of that and has such weird ideas about them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um. Well. Okay. Number one, this. <laughs> Chucky does not exist in the voodoo as we know it, as, as it's been advertised, you know, the, either Chucky or, you know, making a doll and putting sticks in it. Yeah. And the Louisiana voodoo, they do work with dolls in Louisiana. They work with that. That's part of their um, system. Okay. Uh -huh. In Haiti, um, we don't work with voodoo dolls in that way. Okay, not to go after people and, and turn them into effigies of people to work on. Dolls are symbolic of portals. So not just dolls, dolls, any kind of makeshift embodiment tool. Um, the similarity of that might be something like a familiar. It's not a close distinction. It's not a close uh, explanation, but it's close enough that maybe some, of, some people who are familiar with Wicca might be able to understand. But in Haiti, we don't create dolls and stick pins in them. Okay. So yeah, my family, yeah, I have never seen a doll in my altars and um, in my own, in my lineage, in my work. Now, there are bokors. There are different types of roles that somebody can have within a voodoo house. And each person may have a different, uh, for example, those who work as a policing agent for bad spiritualists who literally their role is to govern that. Um, they have these structures and, and individual entities type things that they make, but they're not voodoo dolls that come with. So it's a, it's a, the only way I can answer it is, no, we don't have that. Um, some people might. I've never worked with them. I have a doll, but I don't stick pins to it. It's actually a doll that I, it's no different than psychologists saying, have a doll to um, express your inner child. <laughs> <laughs> okay <laughs> it's, it's it's definitely not exactly that so i want to make sure people don't think i'm, I'm so that's comparing. a very hollywood thing i guess yeah and then if you see some other places that it's being done like for example i mean there's a lot of witchy movies where you'll see that being used and i often wonder i'm like well why would that be in a in a wicca um movie or is that wicca 
Uh, no, I think they just try to stick everything together and anything that's ever been labeled evil, let's put it in this movie. <laughs> put it in a nice big map. And then um, I do know there's groups and certain um, who use um, a doll, but that's made out of sticks and stuff like that. But again, it's not using it's not used for the purpose of harming people. It's used it's actually used in a way for communicating with ancestors. Some groups do that. But um Okay. If, yeah. And all I can say to those of you who have doubts whether that's true or not, if it was that easy to <laughs> create effigies of people and stick pins in them and make them and cause harm to them, please explain to me why, why we have to play pay, play billions for the military. You know, come on. So no. Um, now, does it have um, does it have purposes? Having let's say a familiar, I work with familiars that are object objects, um, but not for the purpose of harming people. I've done it for the purpose of um, deepening my own um, ability to hear from a distance, deepening my own ability to see from a distance, um, my ability to connect with my own inner stuff. Okay. But that's just me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> could uh, could you let us know, because we're running out of time here, where people could get a hold of you? I know you have a, a profile on our website, shamanicarts.studio, but you have websites as well, right? Uh, absolutely. So um, my organization name is Soto Tutu, which is S O. D O T U T U um, dot net. So that's my webpage, and literally everything is on there. <laughs> okay. So it has all the information that you need. I also have my own Facebook, Twitter, all of the social media stuff, Twitter. Um, so just look for Soto Tutu. Uh, but I definitely recommend um, emailing me. That's the easiest and best. And you can do that at tutu at soto tutu dot net. Okay. Um, or contact me online, or and definitely Facebook me, because I find that that's sometimes people just want to know, uh, just want to connect. So that's right. good too. Okay, I will do that. Thank you so much for being with us today. My pleasure. It was nice meeting you as well. Thank you for inviting me. <laughs>